What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Daily Stack. In today's episode, I've been really excited about this one, but uh, today's episode is brought to you just like every episode by Turnkey Connections. Over at Turnkey Connections, we've kind of taken a content first approach and we've kind of been helping people produce their podcasts, their vlogs, um, anything they needed to kind of get their message out to any sort of an audience but we have really dug deep into the podcast world we've actually got uh, our hands in quite a few podcasts here at uh, Turnkey Connections so um, if you have anything that you would like to work on in the marketing realm podcast realm uh, social media anything that we might be able to help you with you can over, go over there to turnkeyconnectionsgroup.com and let us know how we can help you. Today's episode is a very exciting episode. This is um, one that I had always had thoughts of wanting to like find a way and reach out and find this guy and talk to him. But this, um, I found his book book when I was I had just graduated high school so this is probably the person that is responsible for inspiring me to do something in the world of uh, martial arts and kind of in the fight world um, but all around he's a cool guy uh, I, we talked a lot about fighting because that's kind of the realm of which that I know him for but he has uh, written three books and he is a fascinating person i hope i didn't fangirl out for y'all too much but uh sam sheridan uh i read his book a fighter's heart to inspire me to kind of live my life to the fullest and kind of take these you know the last decade of my life at a pace that was um adventurous is a good way to put it but uh, I really, 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 if you can't tell, enjoyed this podcast. And it did also have a little issue where we clipped out a couple times because, hey, it's 2020 and we're doing this remote. So uh, bear with any of the technical difficulties. And I, I tried to clean it up as best I could. But I hope everyone enjoys Mr. Sam Sheridan. Is there a point to my act? I would say there is. <laughs> All right, and welcome to the Daily Stack, Sam Sheridan. Thanks for having me, man. I'm psyched to be here. Uh, like I was just telling you, man, I was surprised to even get a response. But in today's day and age, it's really interesting how if you just treat it like it's, uh, you know, a community, you can really reach through and touch and, and find the people that you're actually trying to, like, talk to. Yeah, no, I think there's an amazing aspect to that of Twitter, which is, <clears throat> you know, everybody thinks that there's like a fantasy where, People have, you know, people who manage their social media and, and uh, you know, are doing all these things for them. And I think the reality is almost no one, you know, has anybody managing their social media. Maybe a few people, but mostly it's, it's the people. And I think that's the kind of interesting side of it is the people who are good at it and have a kind of affinity for it, um, love it, and, and it works for them. And then, you know, people like me, I'm not very good at it, but, you know, whatever. I'm, you know, I do my thing. It doesn't really matter. I don't, you know, I don't write like that, but um, it has been interesting in that sense of giving people a way to, to reach out and, and contact me or to even talk to pe- you know, people that I'm excited right. about. So. Well, so I discovered you by pure happenstance. I was with my family headed to Alaska and we have, my family has a pretty deep tie to Alaska. My grandfather helped uh, plant churches up there when oh, wow. I was a little like, And he died when I was a kid, but um, so I never got to really experience a bunch of his connection to it. But my family's already always kept a pretty deep tie to Alaska through that. And um, in turn, the Iditarod. So like I grew up like mesmerized with the Iditarod and like watching that. 
my senior trip when I was graduating high school, like all my friends were going to like Cancun and like partying and whatnot. My family, me, my two sisters, my mom and my dad went and we actually worked the first checkpoint of the Iditarod on the Itna River. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> and so like that's, uh, th that was kind of like what I grew up in. And right. so we were sitting in the airport and I was trying to, you know, figure out I had, you know, uploaded my iPod cause it was, you know, 2008. So you still had to like pre-plan your playlist and that was a skill back in the day. Yeah. And, um, then, uh, I was walking through a bookstore and I saw the cover of a fighter's heart, which for the listeners that don't know, like it's you covered in blood. After my, mom, my mom loves that cover. My mom <laughs> always resented that cover and, and uh, been horrified and looked away, you know, not been able to kind of make eye contact with that cover. So it, it beyond the shadow of a doubt, it, it piqued 18 year old me, 17 year old me's interest immediately. So um, what's the story behind that cover and kind of how could the people get to know you a little bit on the, I, I, I want to introduce my listeners to you in a way that I, 17 year old me sat there and read this book and I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. This was like the <laughs> so most great. fun ever. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, listen, I mean, every now and then I run into a fan or somebody who reads the book and it connects to them. And I'm like, that's the guy I was writing it for. So I, I appreciate it so much that you come and find, found me and, and uh, you know, and just be aware, like you'll never go wrong telling somebody that you like their work. You know what I mean? People yeah. are like, well, you probably are embarrassed. It's like, no, dude, it's good, man. I, I worked hard on it. I love it. Like, tell me, you know, it's like, <laughs> you can never go wrong saying, hey, man, I love that. Or you did a great job. So, yeah. Uh, you know, dealing with artists a lot now, like, it's like, that's, you know, that's just par for the course. But let me see. I mean, you know, that book, I wrote that book. <clears throat> well, that cover, that cover comes from, so it was a men's journal article um, in like, oh God, I don't even know when, like 2001 or two, something like that. Um, I don't remember exactly, but, um, I had been, uh, I had lived in Thailand and fought there and done that stuff in 99, um, wow. which shows you how long ago that was. Um, I mean, we barely had the internet at that point. Like, <laughs> It had just changed to where you had, you had like internet cafes. So you could, you could drop a line to everybody every day. Whereas before, like it was just past the point where you get a postcard every three months from somebody in Thailand. Right. Right. So that was kind of interesting. But yeah, I went over there and I, there's a long story that, you know, I can run off and to all kinds of uh, divergences. But, but um, when I was back from that, this I sort of sailed around the world and worked on boats and I got off and I went to Thailand and uh, and fought there. Um, and when I got back, I you know I, I was doing all kinds of things and I was um, I was a wildland firefighter. I was a Gila hotshot. Um, yeah. And I worked at I worked at the South Pole and I was you know doing all kinds of silly stuff. And I was just kind of transitioning into where you're like you're going to be a creepy old dude, like, as opposed to being like a guy, like nobody's going to give you a job, dude. Like you've had, you're going to end up sleeping on somebody's couch or in their garage. And yeah. Like, yeah. He's really interesting, but he lives in Tony's garage. You know yeah. I mean? that's, no, that's I, in the fight world, I meet those guys every day. I'm like, well, I'm, I'm borderline one of those guys. Like, yeah, I'm no, we so all so like, listen, you, you, then you sell a book and guess what? Now you're a writer. It's fine. Now you're cool. <laughs> Your parents relax. Everybody's like, Oh, he's a writer. It's fine. <laughs> so that's what, you know, that's how that goes. But <clears throat> I met this, this um, agent in New York who was really into the story. And he's like, oh, that's a cool story. <laughs> I can sell that to men's magazines. And we sold the, the, the first, the Thailand story to, uh, to men's journal. And they were like, well, is there another one? And I was like, well, sure. I could go to, to you know, I can do whatever. But I was like, I'll go to, to, to Militic and I'll go to MFS in Iowa and, and, uh, and um, you know, and I'll write about that. And uh, a great photographer named Ben Lowy, who's like a, that was an early assignment for him, but he's done like a bunch of Time Magazine covers and like won all kinds of awards since then. And like, he's like a celebrated photographer, uh, took those shots. And I, yeah, I got, you know, I got my face rearranged. It was like, you know, I got smashed. Um, but I, I cut weight to make, uh, 
to make 75 and the guy was 205. That's my excuse. Wow. Wow. And he was better. He was a lot better than I was hoping. <laughs> I, I've I've had I have one of my amateur fights where I showed up for a, a fight that was the first at first it was supposed to be 170 then it got moved to 185 then it became 185 day of weigh-ins and we walked in and I looked across the the cage and dude weighed every bit of 215 and yeah, they were like they were like you didn't even you didn't even try and you're like yeah of course I'm gonna fight I'm here I came yeah up. they were like you're gonna fight and I was like of course I'm like I'm yeah. bad but yeah I'm still gonna fight <laughs> I wish I'd eaten yesterday I wish I felt great but uh, I'll still you know and I, and I, you know just as an aside I think the fight itself is a blast like you know yeah. if I can fight without training. I do it all the time because it's so exciting and so like it's just like ah crazy and like you know you run around and like. It's just how, the training and the way. How did you explain? So it you said you were in Thailand in '99. So when you pitched this story, had what, what was that in the '90s as well, or was no, that 2000? I so I was sailing around the world. I worked on. So I got out of college, um, and I you know thought about doing this and that, and I ended up somebody offered me a job on a sailboat, and I sailed around the world working for this guy. And so I was getting paid, you know, 1800 bucks a month or whatever, not that much, but I couldn't spend any of it. Right. Was, you know, I was just, and I was having, I was living the dream, right? I sailed across the Pacific on a sailboat that had a tanks and compressor, right? So we could scuba dive everywhere. I mean, it was like a dream come true for your college, post-college job. Right. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, you kind of, you, you know, I was going through some things and trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I ended up in, in Australia. And I sort of discovered Muay Thai and I boxed in college a little bit um, and loved it, like loved it, yeah. but never taking it seriously. I was like a smoker and I was a party dude and all that stuff. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, clean up my act and I'm going to take this seriously. So I went to Thailand and found a camp and the only, there was only two camps at the time in Thailand that would take foreigners. It was Sidney Tong and Pattaya and Fairtex. Right. And Fairtex was in Bang Pli, which is like a suburb of Bangkok. Um, and I ended up at Fairtex and uh, I ended up staying for six, seven months or something like that. You know, I stayed, 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 and stayed, stayed and loved it. But it was very, it's very like meditative and strange when you're in that kind of world. Because all you do is eat, sleep and train. Um, there were a couple of, you know, foreigners would come through. We were like, but we were sleeping on the floor with the fighters. It wasn't, it, it's fair Texas since, you know, they, in 2000, uh, when I went back in 04, 05, they had turned it into like a hotel. Pool like a camp. Night. And yeah. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, they, they realized they're making more money from their torts than from their fighters, which is like, fair enough. I don't fault them for that, but it wasn't like that. Uh, fighters still- don't necessarily make the best, uh, uh, business plan. They, no, no. They're exciting, and, but you know, they, they don't yeah. pay their bills. Yeah, you're not, you're, it's a losing thing. It's like, you know, you're doing it for, for the name and they've had some great success, but um, so anyway, I did that. I fought there. I ended up fighting like a kind of a cool story. It was a, it was a, um, there's a documentary about this, by the way, uh, that Nat Geo International made, which is on Vimeo, I believe. It's called A Fighting Chance. Yeah, I think I've actually seen it. Yeah, I think I watched it. Was it like it came out like a couple years, like a while a ago? Time. It's a yeah. long time. Ago. But I, but there was a, there was a couple other stories in there, and they needed a white dude, you know, who could speak English, getting his first fight. So I was getting my first fight. I ended up fighting a, a Japanese guy who was the Western Osaka heavyweight karate champ, you know. Um, but thank God he wasn't in shape. Um, and I, just, <laughs> you know, I, I hit him with a knee, and he gassed out. He was he wasn't really. I think he wasn't quite mentally he had just come over you know it was like the weather and the heat and um but i beat that guy so you know that was like a cool story it was like a, a story that was kind of like custom made um for men's journal which of right course, when i you know but i would just tell it at bars or whatever or tell it to girls and that was my you know currency <laughs> but, uh, yeah yeah, yeah. i met this guy he's like oh i can sell that story right so he, my you know is it one of those interesting things where an agent i actually met somebody in new york who really you know started my career in an interesting way and he's an, an interesting guy who finds people like you and me who are like maybe not going to tell their story but 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 then end up you know enjoying it and and you know and then and then you know they were like well, is there a book in this and i was like sure and then i took the money and now you're screwed right because now right. i've spent half the money and i gotta give my book so that was and that was how a fighter's heart you know and i, I 
I had a great time. I mean, I was with Militich and, and, and that was amazing. And, um, and, you know, just to be clear, I'm not like a great fighter. I was like, right, right, right. I was like reasonably like, re I'm like reasonably durable for like, you know, for what I am, but I'm like, you know, I'm slow and all that shit. I'm not good at anything. Um, I was sort of, a, I don't mind getting punched. You know, I'm one of those guys. Right. So I can sort of, I was like, I, I wasn't like a, a, a bad guy to have around the gym. I work, I like to work and I can get shape, and, but I was never going to be champ. And yeah. I knew that, right? You know, and I think that's important for, you know, when I talk to fighters and stuff, it's like, are you going to be champ? Do you really, think really, you're really be champ? Because yeah. if you don't, don't go pro. Don't do it. Because yeah. everybody yeah. else you're meeting and thinks they're going to be champ and is training six, seven days a week and has backing and nutritionists and like, and they're going to hurt you and, you know, it's not that fun. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, man. So, you know, it was, listen, it was great to me. I, MMA was awesome to me. And it, the book came out in, I think, oh, four. Okay. And the ultimate fighter TV show hit spike in oh five. And I think that was the, you know, sort of one of the pivotal events, um, and, and blew MMA up in a sense. Um, <clears throat> you know, whatever you think about that show and whatever that was, it, it, it did, it did change the landscape. Um, so I was oh, yeah. lucky in that sense, you know, too. That, uh, the, the show, I think, kind of gave the avenue for a lot of my generation of guys that ended up coming in. And, like, I'm currently – I've hit that point now that I've met the guys in my career that I'm like, oh, this is what top level looks like. I better be working at the same pace, if not more, than the guys that are, I see next to me that are working this hard. Like, they, there's somebody out there that will outwork you. and. Yeah. That's the, the, the biggest lesson that I've learned is that and taking care of my body has been my, my last like year and a half lesson has been forced on me of like, I got to take care of things, pay attention to the mileage and understand that like there is mileage happening. Right. Yeah. No, no, it's, it's an interesting thing. And then, you know, and you evolve as a martial artist, as a person, you know, there's a really interesting progression and, you know, they always talk about like, you don't start you don't really understand things until you teach them, right? So like your wrestling gets a lot better once you start teaching. And it's just weird, man. It's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. It was invaluable though. Like I can't, I can't, you know, we can bitch about brain damage and all that stuff, but I can't fault MMA and, and the fight game for, for what it gave me in, in all kinds of ways. Yeah. And uh, like, so did your writing come before the, before the fighting or did it kind of evolve as you started getting involved in this? Cause that's primarily what I know you for is the fight game, but you have other works you've done and other things. So was that something that you always knew you were going to like be a, I, I guess, would you call yourself like a lifestyle writer? Is that, would that be a good? No, I'm just a writer now. I mean, I call yeah. myself a writer. I mean, I, <clears throat> um, a fucking awesome writer. No, I, uh, <laughs> No, I think, um, I, listen, I, I grew up without a TV as a little kid. My parents were into it. Are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Well, I lost good? you. I'm still here. Hold on. Hello? Hold on. You still there? Oh, man. Oh, you just, there you are. Hello. There we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I'll ask you for a minute. Yeah, we're good. Um, right. we'll pick right back up wherever that was. What were we talking about? We said. So I got it. Um, go ahead. Yeah, so I I grew up without a TV, and I uh, you know, I read. So I read all the time. My parents weren't into the television. Um, okay. And so I, you know, I kind of wanted to write um as a little kid, and I would write, you know, just sheer plagiarism of books I liked, like The Hobbit or whatever. I just straight up plagiarized it. So it was always kind of in on the radar, but <clears throat> I never thought I would write nonfiction um, until I met this guy in New York who kind of was like, hey, you know, this is how you sell stuff. This is like a, because the fiction market, so the fiction market is really hard to get into. It's like, as you see at a supermarket, uh, at the airport, it's, it's eight people that dominate 95% of fiction sales. Right. It's the, you know, it's Stephen King and those kind of things. You know, it's like trying to break into that crowd is really hard. Whereas nonfiction is a, is a, is a pretty much an equally big market. And they just need 
people all the time. And they're always looking for the next, you know, nonfiction thing. So nonfiction is a lot easier to get into uh, just as a writer. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you know, I, I started writing um, after I, but, but the fighting really, I never thought I was going to write about it. I didn't, you know, when I went yeah. to Thailand and fought and did all that stuff, it was purely for myself. It was purely for fun and for the kind of to, to change my life and to help me quit smoking and drinking and all those things. And to kind of like, you know, just to see, I, 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 you know, again, a lot of, a lot of fighters heart is about that, which is like about answering some of those questions that I think, you know, every, a lot of people have and every young man has about whether you're a coward and how you'll behave under stress and how you'll deal with adversity and things like that. And, you know, I, I was in a, in a kind of place where in between, you know, a lot of things that might have led me into the military or some other direction. So this was the kind of route that I, that I took and, and uh, it was great, man. I mean, I, I, again, I think you do learn a lot and it is an incredible education. Um, in any in any way and i think it's invaluable you know i think it's like it's to understand so you learn so much about who you are i mean I, my sort of take home has always been you know fighting you know you, you deceive the guy right like you're it's about deception you're trying to trick the guy but you better not be lying to yourself you know like yeah. you better know who you are and don't try to be somebody you're not like don't 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 go in there with a guy that you shouldn't and don't don't you know you're, if you're not if you're not Pernell Whitaker, you better fight, you know, you better get your, you know, you better fight tall and be yeah. defensive. And, you know, it's like there's those lessons of identity, I think, are really valuable and, and, uh, and forced on you by a fight in a, in a kind of much more direct way. Yeah, I think, I think, in, I think, I think in jujitsu is, is where I've seen a lot of that. And did we freeze again? Am I moving? Are you there? Oh no. There you are. There we go. But I was saying I think I think in jujitsu is where I've seen a lot of the same type of you you you'll get your card pulled. Like you can't go into a room and especially like in the last I was just telling this story to somebody like two or three days ago of my I had one of my first sparring sessions with a guy that was like a UFC level guy. And we were just like in hand wraps, like warming up like shadow sparring. And he whizzed a punch past my head that made me go, oh, I better move. <laughs> this, this is fight pace. Like, he's not going to try to hit me, but if I'm in the way, it's my fault. <laughs> and that was my first exposure to, like, and he, I mean, he ragdolled me for, like, an hour and a half. And right. I was like, I, I learned two things. A, what my real weight class was, was not 170. <laughs> and, and, and B, that, like, when you come in with intensity, like, you've got to come in with the intent that you're, you're in the, in the hurt. I heard uh, you were on, on the fighter's mind that I, I told you I was re-listening to that on the audio um, that um, it was taught. You were, you were talking to somebody that said that like, I was either going to do this or wind up in prison. Right. I don't remember who the quote was from, but it was like, right. I, I'm very similar. Like you're saying, like, I was either going to go in the military and do the craziest thing they were going to let me to do legally. I was going to jump out of something. I like, I was always going to do that. And when I found your book, it was kind of one of those things that like, I had always kind of heard of, I was at that age group where I'd heard of UFC. I'd heard of the ultimate right. writer. It was kind of like growing. And then after I read your book, like I kind of like molded over and I got introduced to a wrestling and, and I got, I, I went to a wrestling, um, just open like training and just got killed for an hour. And then like six months later, discovered jujitsu. And like, I hadn't looked back. Like, that's awesome, man. That's yeah. great. So that, that, that was fascinating in, in that time at the beginning, I was asking you, like, how did you come to, how did, how was it recepted at that time period when you're like, hey, I got this cool story about Muay Thai when you got to like Men's Journal, like what was their response to that? Oh, people thought, I mean, listen, it was very much like you're a lunatic and you're like a somewhat dangerous weirdo. And, you know, I, I had even I had like, you know, so I would do book readings for a fighter's heart and I had guys stand up and be like, you know, what you're talking about is like disgusting and it's like, it's human cockfighting and all that shit was still, you know, right. and, 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 and it's like, literally it's like, 
you just have a problem with this because it's it's affecting your manhood. You're standing up in this room trying to challenge me because it makes you feel better. You know, it's like got nothing to do with the sport or me. This is about this person who's like, I'm gonna make a stand about human cockfighting. It's like, no, you have a manhood issue and you're intimidated and scared or whatever, you don't like it. Uh, but it was so clear, you're like, this has got nothing, like this is not the book, dude. I don't know what to tell you, man. Uh, this is your issue, you know, it's like not. Um, How does somebody yeah, like that make it all the way through your book long enough to have an opinion strong enough to they come They didn't read the book. Reading. They didn't read the book. Okay. Uh, the people who just came to the reading to try to like, you know, get up on their hind legs and bray like a goat about, you know, make a point and sound cool and be like, you know, I, I find make, they're making like a moral statement, you know, basically. Like, I got you. So, well, then you navigate through all this and, and you, you find your writing career kind of come, was this, this, was this your, this is my discovery of you, but was this your first like true writing or was there like more before that? No, this is the, this is how I got started. So this is, okay. you know, Fighter's Heart really was the first, you know, my first book, it was my way in and it forced me to become a writer. Like if you have to write a book, you know, and I had written a, I'd written a murder mystery in college that I, you know, nobody would buy. And, and, but you know, it, it was, some of it was good, but most of it's bad. You know, it's like you, you have to learn these things. Writing is very much a muscle and a very much a skill that you, you do for 10 years before you get good at, right? Like a lot of things. So <clears throat> yeah, I mean that book, I'm proud of that book, but I've definitely become a lot better writer. And, uh, I think it was, you know, it, was a, you know, it took four or five years. Um, <clears throat> and then I came up with, I had another book I was going to do, um, which I sold uh, the idea. So it used to be, so the book business has changed. You used to be able to sell a proposal, right? And get money to write it. Right. If, you could write, if you could show you could write. So you'd have to show them, you know, here's a couple of chapters. Here's what the rest looks like. And maybe they give you a hundred thousand dollars and you go write the book. And the way the book business has changed is now they'll give you $20,000. They'll give you 15,000. It's like, there's, there's no advances anymore. So the advances, unless you're, you know, a Kennedy or a Clinton or something like you're right. some huge name, you're not going to get enough money to write the book. So You have to have a job and keep your job while you're writing a book now, basically is what's, is what's, what's, you know, it's what's driven me away from the business. So now I'm, I mean, I'm a TV writer. Now. You know, okay. I'm a TV guy now. So, and by the way, half these writers in Hollywood, the TV writers, they're guys who used to write books and have switched over because they want to buy a house. You know, and it's just right. that's how it goes. Is it what what has driven it to that? Is it has like the has it been just the book demand or lack thereof? Or no, the demands is high. I mean, pretty high. It's right. like people, you know, is it eBooks? No, no. I think it's the I think it's the over. I mean, I think it's a bigger question about like capitalism in America and these overall conglomeration of the, the smaller publishing houses have been bought up by bigger ones and they need to show, you know, certain percentage growth and certain percentage profit. And so they're, they're moving into that more tentpole, you know, kind of model, which is like, so they have one book that they're going to, you know, market the shit out of and it's going to be Harry Potter, right? Like it's going to be something, right. you know, something you've heard about. And they're going to make money off that. And they're not going to take a lot of risk on authors. I don't, I don't really know. I don't know if anybody really knows, but, but, but certainly in my career of writing books, I saw the, 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 um, the advanced business change and the advanced business kind of vanish. How, how many of the writers that you're talking about like this could make a shift to like podcasting now that like, it's kind of a proven pathway now that's I've been, I've, that's kind of the my the way that I have decided to delve off and be able to fund my fight career, my fight world is through the marketing and media world because I was working on a power a line crew and um I finished my degree and because I was like I was like I don't I don't want to like be risking my life and climbing poles and doing all this, working long hours like my whole life. And, um, when I finished my degree, I started like looking for jobs and I, my mom had always kind of like kept her toe in a marketing company that she had always had. 
So uh, I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, let me just take this that you've already kept a couple of clients, bring things to 21st century and uh, go from there. And basically we turned everything to where now we help produce podcasts and uh, different things like with Cole, like what I'm doing with him, I'm producing his, all of his media, like his vlog, his podcast is all that. So oh, like kind of helping people build that out. And like I've started saying, I was like, these days writing books, you or starting a podcast could be the equivalent of what you would talk about writing a book. Like you and I could go on an adventure and then start a podcast about it and talk about it. And that'd be our book built on top of its back. And we oh, own it. So in a hundred percent, like the, 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 the way to get an advance now is to be like, okay, I have 600,000 followers, right? Uh, okay. okay. And now a company will, will say, you know, do you have national reach? Do you have presence? You know, those kind of, and they look at all that, they look at all that stuff. Like yeah. any deal, any deal, you know, I host, a, I'm hosting a, a, a Nat Geo show that'll come out this Christmas. And it's like, you know, it's just for fun, basically, all this right. stuff. But like that, that, those contract negotiations would be all about my follower base and everything like you. that, you know. I got you. Well, uh, well, if you, if you need anybody that wants to help you run your social, I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Uh, they tried, you know, I listen, I had a long meeting with a, a social media person and I'm just, it's not for me, man. It's no, yeah, it's not for everybody. Yeah. Exactly. And I think you can't force yourself and it's just, you know, maybe it's I'm a generation older that like, is kind of like, you're going to do talk about what, like that's, but also like, I believe in like the art I create and the words is like right. something I think, I think about it a lot and I work on it a lot. I would never show you a first draft. I would never I show you, you a fifth draft. I might show you a 10th draft, you know, like, I got you. It, I just don't feel like that's, you know, my job. Like part yeah. of it is, I obsess about something and I work on it for five years and then I condense it down into very simple and clean and I do the research and I look into the other alleys and the things that might modify this and I come up with an understanding okay. and then I give it to you and you give me money and like that's it. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's like, and there you I go. And you can have it in two weeks. You can never finish it. It's fine. But like that's right. the deal. You know what I mean? Right. I, I get that. And I've like, as I've come up in like what I'm trying to do and the like, things that I put out there and that I put together, like understanding, like trying to live off of it too, changes it a little bit. And like the, um, like what you're talking about is in, in jujitsu, like what I've tried to bring to it. And I got mesmerized by like filmmaking and editing by people like uh, Spike Jones, like sure. watching, watching old skate videos, old documentaries, shaky, like fly on the wall footage. Like that's my favorite style, like super, grungy kind of dirty type stuff but the reason I like that is that like I grew up with a bunch of friends that had older brothers and so like they were doing like really cool stuff like stuff you were doing like a boxing or karate or something that I wanted to sit back and watch so like for me as a consumer I would love to get to watch hours of you pouring over all that stuff and see the behind the scenes of how it was made so like I get kind of hung up in the art side of things and I'm kind of learning that lesson right now of how do you still get paid even though you have this like pull towards the artist side of things yeah I mean listen the art and commerce is a is a, is a you know a crux that we've been dealing with for a long time where they meet and the intersection and I think commerce is like very valuable in terms of you know I don't believe in like you know I don't believe in in uh in you know stuff that doesn't meet people halfway like you've got to come all the way and get right. the, the audience and and you got to show them like they don't have to do any work like i think there's stuff that's really indulgent you know and it's like you got to do some processing for me man you got to figure this out like whenever somebody has a video of a fighter's interview i'm like just write it up and give me what they said i don't want to watch this whole thing about like oh my. it's like two minutes of my life dude yeah, give me, yeah, did he say yeah. anything interesting if he didn't it's fine but like yeah. i'm not gonna watch this you know and i think it's just laziness and it's like indulgence but you know there's there's definitely a mix and i think you know <clears throat> having to sell stuff, having to make money as an artist is great. You know, it, it, right. it forces you to be hungry and be creative and, and, and that's where good art comes from. Right. It's like, it's being, it's being on that edge, you know, 
if you're just doing whatever you want, like your arts, it's indulgent and it's not that good. Right. You know, it's like when a, when a big actor does a tiny movie because he because nobody will say no to him. Is the movie good? No. It's like, but if if it's a starving guy and he you know he'll starve and make that if he has to make money, he makes a much better product. You know, so there's there's I think there's that kind of there's real value in that. In the hunger, yeah, I th- I, I think that some people. And I think that some people can uh, simulate that or, or, or create that themselves. Like I've, I recently, we had a guy come on at the camp here that is uh, uh, one of the most talented fighters I've ever been around in my life. Like one of the, one of the most talented athletes I've ever been around in my life. And I've been watching him like do the like little things. And I'm like, oh, that's what that looks like. Of like, that's that other fighter your coach tells you about. That's the guy that's like (laughs) out there working way harder than you could ever conceive. Right. But yeah. Yeah. No, that's invaluable. Those are, you know, it's all good, man. It's all those things. You you know, it's it's so fun though when you finally get to work out with like you know high level pros, and you're like, oh my god, dude. It's like he's. It's like you and me beating up an eight-year-old, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like the eight-year-olds can do what he wants, but like he's never going to hurt this person. Yeah. And whenever this person wants to, they can just shut it all down, you know. It's, yeah. It's it, a, it's, a, seeing somebody that's at that level in any martial art is, has always been kind of uh, mesmerizing to me, even more so than like seeing the guys that I saw when I was like playing college football and stuff. Like, yeah, like it's crazy to see like a 350 pound man run like a, you know, four, seven forty. That's crazy. But like watch somebody like that hold another man, the same size down for five minutes. Yeah that's more terrifying to me of like, Oh, that's, that's horrifying. That, that, that man could do anything he wants to me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that was the joke. I remember somebody, so I didn't, I never trained with Fedor, but somebody trained with him and they were like, it's like his bones are all super dense. And like, you can't like, it's like you kick him and you hurt yourself basically. And like a lot of those guys, I feel like there's some of that too, which is, I mean, Pat Militich, we put him on a surfboard dude and he was like a piece of concrete. Yeah, it's like the surfboard would like submerge. You're like that guy just, is like super dense dude. That is too funny. That's yeah. That's uh the the fighter I was just talking about that uh we were swimming the other day and I I grew up swimming like I don't remember learning how to swim. My parents like had me like learning how to swim when I was a baby. So like. And then I swam on a team that, like, a lot of the guys that I swam with, like, went and swam in college, swam on the Olympic oh, team. Wow, that's cool. And so, like, it just so happened that, like, in high school, I was in high school with these guys. I was nowhere near a good swimmer. Like, I, I had the wrong body type. I wanted to play football, so, like, I started gaining muscle and stuff. But yeah. I've been teaching guys like that how to swim my whole life. And that, that when, when you see a guy that's, like, built out of solid muscle and he can't get past this, yeah, totally. Pull those into the water. I'm like, bro, let me help you. Like, that's you're gonna like destroy yourself trying to swim like that. Sure. But yeah, um, but man, the 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 writing part like really interests me and like kind of I, I got uh, tied up in the the fighter's mind, like paying attention to how like you tie in your 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 thought processes as you were kind of like reflecting on it. Like you said, like you're not necessarily like the same level as these guys but you're in the room with them and so you kind of get to see a different side yeah no that definitely helps i think you you know it's like if you can sweat alongside somebody even 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 in like a cardio workout you know what i mean even in like a a conditioning workout that's not and but if you go through it they have a different reaction to you when you ask them a question it's like you're not some guy with a pencil like you're it's this other thing and that you know that takes time and work but i think it's it's a good way to you know, get through, I mean, these little subcultures and these interesting cliques, they're, they're weird. And, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like infiltrating a terrorist cult, right? Like it takes <laughs> it's time. Like you have to be, you can't just show up. Nobody's going to trust you. So it takes, it takes bleeding with people and, and being around them and, and, um, you know, but it, but it pays off because you get a different kind of access and you get oh, a yeah. different side of things. Oh yeah. That's my, my actually like, I, joked at the beginning that I'm one of those guys that's just crashing on my, my little sister actually hit me up. Like, I guess now it's just over a year ago. She hit me up and was like, Hey, I want to try jujitsu. And like, I'd already at that point, you know, I've been training for seven years. I've 
deep in the MMA community. I was up in Atlanta, yeah. like trying to find my way, like breaking into the pro scene over up in Atlanta. And uh, she was down here in like middle Georgia. And I was like, yeah, I'll come. I had heard of this guy called Cole Miller. Like he's over there in middle Georgia. I was like, I'll, I was like, it's an American top team. So like, they may be like really like a serious place. So let, let me come like introduce you and make sure like it's a cool place. Yeah, totally. It, here I am a year later crashing. Not, I'm, I've moved up from the couch to the guest room for a little while. But, like, <laughs> my, my, my wife and I have always had the relationship of, like, you know, if you're going to go do something, like, go do it all the way. And so, yeah. like, um, she, I, I've, I've been over here, like, trying to, like, really dig into this and, and do all, all that. And the um, – I lost it, you. Oh, did I lose you? Oh, oh, oh. Let me try to boost. How's that? You frozen. Well, oh, there you are. I lost You're you for a minute. Yeah. But I, I don't know if it's my internet or your internet, but it, mine's good, man. I have, I'm, 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 a, I'm in a good place. I have good internet here. So it's gotta be yours. Well, it's, prob know, it's, it's probably mine. I'm somewhere in the middle, in middle Georgia with, you know, it's, it's the country. Or I, I spend a lot on my internet these days to have fast internet. Well, everybody's zooming, you know what I mean? It's like I got a kid who's zooming and all this stuff, you know, it's just, it just sucks. Yeah, that's, uh, but well, and I was going to ask you, like, so are, are you still training anywhere? Are you doing, are you doing uh, any type of training? So I, you know, I, 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 I lift. <laughs> lift, yeah, yeah. As you can tell, you know, I, I, I do stuff for my mental health, basically. But um, I haven't rolled in a long time. I still, you know, I, st I was boxing, you know, just hitting stuff and doing whatever. Um, I wrote a book called, you might like actually called Disaster Diaries. That's my third book. Yeah, that's, I actually was going to, I was leading into like, I actually have made it halfway through that book. Well, there's a, there's, I was going to say, there's a, there's a part where I go sled dogging, right? So I go okay. up to the, uh, up to the Inuit and I did sea ice survival and uh, it's fan, it's not the harness, it's the fan kind of sled dogs and stuff. Okay. Like but, um, and it was real interesting. I mean, because you get into like, you know, you get into these, it's like an interesting sort, sort of sea ice survival thing. But then you find out about, um, you know, that the, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police culled their dogs in the 60s and killed all their dogs. So you get into this like really dark, like, you know, First Nations, Native American genocide kind of thing where you're forcing people into villages and you killed all their dogs because you know they, they didn't understand or whatever but it's it's right. it's an interesting you know topic that that um and that's my best book by the way i think like that that in terms of writing and stuff um, okay but uh that was more too just for you know again it was like how do i string together a whole bunch of fun shit to go do you know I was right like, oh, if it's about survival then then there's a there's a key to it um but uh so that came out when when did that come out 2010 maybe so how if, if like how much were you anticipating something like if you had told you in 2010 that today was where we'd be sitting would you be like yeah that makes sense i gotta tell you i was at so i live in santa monica and uh me and my wife went out to dinner a few days ago and you know everything's outside but you're sitting right. there and the sky is, you know, this weird, creepy red. And the sun is this little ball. And, like, everybody's in masks. And you're like, is this kind of what the end of the world looks like? I mean, I guess I guess it could be. Yeah, listen, I, you know, I, I never thought it was going to, you know, I still, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about things. Yeah. I think, I think uh, you know, I think we have to be aggressive and try to change things and try to, try, particularly, you know, climate change is, like, you know, one of my pet things, just because I traveled so much and I saw it and talked to people who were seeing it for 20 years, you know, it was like, everybody was aware of it. It was only here that people were like, nah. And you're like, no one else questions this dude. Like, what are you talking about? Um, and I have, you know, my, my cousin's a marine biologist and I, her husband's a marine biologist. You know, it's just like, it's not, it's, anyway. So that's, that's something I've been concerned about for a long time, you know, and, right. and I was a firefighter and of course, you know, the fire community, we've been dealing with it and they were dealing with it for, for years. And, and uh, what was interesting about the fire community was, and, and you see it now, which is more experienced firefighters started dying. 
And it was because these, these, these fuels and the dryness and the humidities and the relative humidities and the pH of everything has changed to where experience isn't a good guide for you anymore. So these guys who were had you know, 15, 20 years and they think they know everything, but they're seeing explosiveness and fuel fire growth and, and you know, combustibility that has never happened. You know, not in our generation, you know, not in, in living right. memory. So, so, you know, it was an interesting kind of thing to see, like, <clears throat> there was a, a danger spot for firefighters. And it used to be at, like, uh, you know, three or four years. Because, you know, the guys who are green are real scared and they don't do anything stupid unless they're idiots. And then after, like, three or four years, you kind of feel like you know what you're doing and guys will get in trouble. But then the, the, the vets, the 20 year vets, 30 year vets would not get in trouble and they would be your advanced scouts and doing stuff on the ground. But now that's changed because these, these, these fuels are so different and, and right. the fire behavior is so different. That's it. My, my little sister actually uh, went to school for uh, wildlife management uh, down here at Auburn. And like a lot of what I've talked to her about before and a lot of her friends and, and, and professors have talked about the, the lack of like, uh, not doing the burns the way that we should and like doing the things that pre prescribed things that we could prevent. <clears throat> um, now nature's kind of just taking care of itself and people are kind of in the way. Yeah. yeah. No, there's all this shit is supposed to be in California, man. It's all supposed to burn. It's all that. Yeah. Anita and like scrub. It's like this should burn every five years. And you're right. Really, you're keeping fire out of it. Um, and of course, like this is a fire ecology and the Ponderosa pine, like all that stuff, you know, it needs to burn all the time. Oh yeah. And in 1910, there was like those terrible firestorms across the Midwest and they basically right. decided that they were going to you know, declare war on fire and they kept fire out of all kinds of places as you know, people have known they need to burn. Yeah. For, you know, since I was doing it, which was 15 years ago, but, but there's just no way to catch up now. There's so no, much yeah. needs to get burned that it's like, it's, it's, yeah. And, and, and it's going to be wild, man. It's like, you know, it's like what happens in Australia, you know, all that stuff. It just, it, right. it, like you get real explosive fire. So that's what so bad here. I, I was going to, I was going to ask, like, it, it, it sounds like you're saying like it, it is living up to some of the photos that we see you know, being on this side of the country, but like, are, are you seeing the mass exodus that it looks like that everybody's saying? No, no, listen, it's, it's fine. Like it's, yeah. It's, no, I mean, it's funny. Cause people are like, I was doing this, some stuff and I was in uh, West Virginia and they were like, well, is all the homelessness really true? In California? And you're like, yeah, no, listen, like, you know, there is this incredible homeless problem. Right. But like, I would be like the fourth wealthiest homeowner in West Virginia if I moved. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like I live in like the smallest, you know, I'm like in the bottom tier of my neighborhood. Like it's yeah. like property prices are insane here. Like the economy is fine. Everybody wants to live here still. Uh, you know, nobody's going anywhere. Like it's not coming yeah. down. But yeah. but yeah, no, it's been weird, man. It's been like, you know, it's almost like being in Norway or or, you know, it's when you're in the Arctic Circle, there's like a red light that lasts all day. Right. So I, when I, I, went, I worked at the South Pole about 2000. And I was there for the summer. <clears throat> and the sun just goes around in a circle, right? It's just right, it's, right. It's real weird. So it's like you wake up in a tear, you go to bed and it's there. And it's yeah. like the worst place you've ever been to be hung over. Uh, but the last like two or three weeks before we, before we left, the sun was starting to set. And everything was red, red for the whole day. It was it oh, was super crazy. crazy. So we had some of that for for a few days here in LA. So um, that's, and it's still bad, but what what were you doing in Antarctica again? Like you were do you were down there for a project, correct? Yeah. So they were building. I was just doing construction there. They were building. Uh, Raytheon had taken over the contract and was building a new station, the South Pole Station. Okay. Um, and they had, you know, two, 250 guys or whatever come in for the summer and 40 stay for the winter. I don't know what they do now. I think it's more stay now for the winter. It was an all year build, but they used to have Quonset huts and, you know, they had their little dome and, um, a few things where people would stay in winter. But, uh, but now I think it's like a hotel. It's like a massive hotel where they could put 400 people up for the, for the winter and, um, all that stuff. Like you get flights in so you can't fly in and out for right. eight months because of the weather um 
so you know it is what it is but yeah it was it was cool i mean it was it was a uh, it was a trip you know it's like the workplace from hell it was <laughs> i can imagine that like i mean th- there's no point in time that you can just walk out in a t-shirt like it's no you can't you can't no people do and you get used to it to the point where if it's not windy and the sun's out it's like 20 below and it feels so warm because the because the sun's out. And and yeah. honestly, you'd be out and drink beer, and your beer gets colder the longer you. <laughs> have, you know, that's the only. <laughs> that's, 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 yeah, I didn't even think about the fact that like you don't even you don't even need koozies. Yeah, exactly. No, your beer gets colder. And there was uh, some guys playing frisbee, and the frisbee hit a wall and shattered like glass. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> So there's things like that, you know, things that get, get weird like that. But, uh, um, yeah, it was cool, man. It was, it was also like a free trip to New Zealand. So like people do it for that. And, right. And right. Money and then you go backpack New Zealand for a couple months or whatever. And you know, it was cool. It was good. That's super cool. So do you have any other crazy like plans for like, you know, I'm, I'm married. I have an 11 year old, man. It's like, everything's changed. I, I write TV now. Um, I'm hosting a show for National Geographic, uh, which they're supposed to come out um, Christmas. And we got uh, five of six episodes shot before COVID shut us down. Oh, wow. So, um, you know, I'm doing this and that, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's changed. You no, know, it's like, you know, things change and you can't kind of immerse when you're responsible for, for someone, particularly kid, you know, it's like, you guess yeah. what, you're on the hook for it. And, uh, and uh, you can't just do whatever you want anymore. Even though I, I still do fun stuff. And I take him, like, you know, I take him with me. He's getting big enough now where I can take him. Um, so we went, you know, hiked around Scotland for a couple of weeks. Which oh, was that's cool. Pretty, pretty yeah. mellow. But it was good for him. It was a good, like, and again, it's like, you know how I say, like, you, you, when you start teaching something, you, you start understanding it in a different way. Right. And it's been fun to kind of, like, take him into, you know, backpacking and more adventurous things and be like, He's like, oh, this feels terrible. And you're like, yeah, listen, man, everybody on this hike feels bad. Nobody's having a good time. Like, this is hot. Everybody's miserable, but you're not going to die. And you're going to be so happy when we make it somewhere cool. Like, and that's the price you pay. So it's like learning these things and talking about them has been, you know, it's, it's fun, man. It's cool. That's it's great. Day. Yeah. I, I, I distinctly remember having a very similar conversation on the side of a trail with my dad. Cause like we did like a lot of backpacking, a lot of that type stuff. And, and so like I grew up with him being like, look, you know, don't be that kid. Like, come on, let's have, you know, the, the end goal is going to be fun. And I learned that pretty early on. And that's, 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 that's great that you're getting to pass that on. But um, man, uh, I haven't even really been tracking the time. I think we're like at an hour. I didn't know if you yeah. had anywhere to be, but um no, that's good for me, man. I appreciate it so much. Yeah, though. yeah. I'll talk to you, man. And I'll do it again if you want. If you want to chat again? I'm happy to do it. One hundred percent. And uh, I've got your contact info. I'd love to get it. the 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 viewers or anything. Do you uh, want to plug anything? Give anybody anywhere to go? Nah, man. It's all uh, good. Good luck. Okay. <laughs> I got nothing for anybody, dude. Whatever. I'm that's cool, man. Yeah. Everybody have a good time. Everybody be yeah, safe. Totally. All right. Well, appreciate it.